Hark. We are here. It is time for another Star Wars Unlimited video. Insanity. Just genuine insanity. What we thought was going to be just one playthrough of the starter decks with maybe a couple previews here and there turned into an hour and a half long stream from Fantasy Flight Games covering the almost entire starter deck, giving us deck lists, giving us all but three cards, a bunch of new previews and a bunch of really fun stuff to go over, which we will later. But we got to take a look at the cards that were shown first and how they shape up what we're going to see with the starter deck experience and then what we might see with aspect design going forward. So get ready. We got a lot to cover and I don't have a lot of time to get it covered. So yeah, our first preview here is aggression and it's an iconic character. If you've watched Empire Strikes Back, you you recognize him and you recognize what he's from and all the other stuff. He's a cool character. It is Admiral Ozel. Let's get you guys a bigger view of this. Two cost aggression villainy ground units. Admiral Ozel overconfidence. Two power, three health, Imperial official. And this is the first card we've seen that's not a leader that has an action ability on it. Action. Play an Imperial unit from your hand, paying its cost. It enters play ready. Each opponent may ready a unit. Somebody theorized that aggression might actually be the take the initiative aspect. We saw a little bit of that with the Starwing Scout by when it gets defeated, if you have the initiative, you get to do uh, the other things that are associated with it. You draw cards. With Ozzel here, if he's your, if he's already on the board and your first action, your opponent has no other units that need to be readied. There's, it's that extra bonus for it. But on the flip side, you could save him as your last action. Your opponent takes the initiative, kind of antithesis to what you potentially want. But then if you have free reign, so you can use your action, play your Imperial, go uh, attack with the Imperial on the next action because you have nothing nothing stopping you. Your opponent's just pass, 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 pass. But Ozzel's going to be very strong already being on the board from the previous round and being able to bring in an Imperial unit from your hand that's ready to go to attack and decimate something, say an Emperor Palpatine or a Relentless or an ATST, whatever you have resources available, Ozzel's going to help you get that through very quickly. You just have to make sure that either your opponent doesn't have units on the board, your opponent doesn't have exhausted units, or you're willing to allow your opponent to ready something up to get an extra effect or an extra attack, depending on what comes out. Ozzel's a really cool card. I think he's going to be used in a lot of decks. I don't know that he's going to be a three of. He probably might be a two of in most aggression decks that want to play Imperials, but we'll have to see going forward. Next, we have one of a suite of events that we were able to see during this stream. It's an interesting one. It's an effective one, but how effective will be an interesting question going forward. It is the Asteroid Sanctuary. It is a two cost cunning event. It's a trick. It says exhausted enemy units. Give a shield token to a friendly unit that costs three or less. Most of the time, this card is going to say pay two exhausted enemy units. I think the shield token should be considered a bonus at all times and should never be considered something that you are guaranteed to get as you continue to play the game. By the time this comes into play, unless you're playing a lot of low to the ground units, you might not have three cost or less units available to be able to do this. If your first action in a round is deploy 3PO, or R2, and your next action, if you have the resources, is Asteroid Sanctuary. Yes, you can stop an opponent's unit from attacking and give a shield token to one of your, your extra characters that needs to stick on the board. And this does say exhaust an enemy unit, not an enemy non-leader unit. So you could do this to your opponent's leader, very strong against Vader and Luke. And then because it says cost three or less, you would not be able to put this on any leader unless it came out with three resources as an epic action and on the flip side costed three. That's a really good design decision that I didn't really notice until actually reading the card again right now. So you'll never be able to drop a shield on your own leader. I don't think this is strong. Uh, a lot of things that I'm thinking about for these, these events is they need to be able to do more if they're gonna cost this much. Uh, force choke, being able to damage to get something off the board permanently, even if it draws your opponent a card. That's a, a, a strong effect for the ability to use for two costs or for one cost. Waylay is the same way. You pay three and it, it dumps a unit back to your opponent's hand. They have to build the resources to be able to get that back up or utilize them in the next round or so on and so forth. Exhausting a unit is good, but it doesn't 
eliminate the threat of something like Sentinel or the threat of something like a shield. It, it doesn't it doesn't really eliminate the problems that you're going to be seeing. It can stop a unit from attacking one turn, but it doesn't do anything other than that. And then obviously, like I said, the bonus is a shield. So it's an OK card. I'm not probably going to run it unless something bonkers comes out that deals with exhausted units, but you might. And that's what matters to you. Next, we have a rebel hero, General Dodonna. This image is very familiar to me because it's one of the cards that I've seen the most in Star Wars, the Decipher Star Wars game. But we have General Dodonna here, Masasi Group Commander, four cost heroism ground units, four power, four health, rebel official, other friendly rebel units get plus one, plus one. So this is good for that, not necessarily low to ground, but a lot of rebel units being able to put him on the board and every, every one of your rebel units, both space and ground, get plus one, plus one. It's an uncommon 242 from uh, SOR. I've been forgetting these as I've been recording these videos. My apologies. Great card, great booster. This is what we traditionally in the card gaming industry call as an anthem effect. And an anthem effect is basically a card that sticks on the board and flat boosts one specific type of thing or like it can boost all creatures or all, all units in this game. Other ones we've seen before are boost all uh, warriors, all birds, all ghosts, spirits, things like that. This one is specifically other friendly rebel units and it almost never applies to the thing itself that is giving the ability. And once this guy leaves the board, you obviously no longer get the effect, but Dodonna has a powerful Anthem effect for Rebels. And as we'll see later, there's a continuing design of the way that Heroism and Villainy cards are where they get similar things that are costed and built differently in terms of power and health. But Dodonna, pretty good, probably a two of, especially at that four cost, maybe a three of. Maybe you really wanna get that Anthem out on the board and be able to drop those plus one, plus ones on your Rebel. I hope we get more effects like that for as many traits that are factions as they want to build into the game. Would love it for Republic, would, would love it for Separatists, but I would also like to see more for Rebels and again, if thing, the things are designed equally, Imperials as well. Next, the opposite of what we just saw, and that is General Veer's three cost villainy ground unit, Blizzard Force Commander, three power, three health, Imperial Official, other friendly Imperial units get plus one, plus one. Uncommon 230 out of 252 SOR. Dodonna was four, four, four. General Veers is 333. Three, three. This plus one, plus one effect, Anthem, does a lot more for Imperials than it does for the Rebels. The Rebels have, right now has a lot of units that they can get out there at varying different costs. The Imperials tend to run a package of units. Tarkim, Cell Block Guard, TIE Advanced, TIE Interceptor, that have a lot more power into what they are and what they do, that, that a plus one, plus one will assist them. And if you're running Krennic, this also increases your ability to get that damage onto units without them dying, because you do get that plus one, plus one. With Krennic on the board, if you have a damaged unit, it's technically getting plus two, plus one. And the fact that this guy's a three cost really pushes this specific game type much higher higher for the Imperials than it does the Rebels. Because remember, this can come down round two, phase two, second phase, round two, two round two. We're gonna say round two. Whereas you need to wait until round three in order to be able to get something like this on the board with the Rebels, because they're down as four cost. Not all of the Imperial versions of these cards are the best, but the Imperial versions of the cards are really friggin' good. I worry a little bit about that, but I also trust that there's gonna be other things that the Rebels will want that will compensate for the fact that some of their effects are a little bit more expensive than the Imperial ones, and also potentially vice versa. Because remember, the Wing Leader, it costs less than the TIE Advanced, but because the TIE Advanced has a bigger body than the Wing Leader and is harder to deal with in space. You get what I'm going for. If you've watched my previous videos, you've seen how these things work. Uh, but Veers is a great card. I think this is an automatic three of in any Imperial deck because again, three cost, comes out, plus one, plus one to your entire board if you're all Imperials. Vader's gonna love this, the Emperor's gonna love this, any of your attackers are gonna love this, your your Imperial Sentinels, like the Cell Block Guard and the Royal Guard. And remember, Veers turns on Sentinel for the Royal Guard. It's, it's a win, 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 win. Veers is all wins. All we do is win. Next up is my favorite space unit that we've seen so far. Relentless is cool, but this guy, the Gladiator Star Destroyer, six cost command villainy space unit, five power, six health, Imperial vehicle capital ship. When played, give a unit sentinel for this phase. Units in this arena can't attack other non-sentinel units or your base. It's a common number 86 out of 252 in SOR. This guy comes down and goes AU, 
defend us for the turn. And he can give it to himself. If you're under threat of space, the gladiator star destroyer goes, hey, I'm here, even in the picture. Blast, 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 blast. Just blasting away the way that a star destroyer should. I love this ship because it was one of the, it was one of the early ships featured in Star Wars Armada. I have one of these, I bought one. It was one of the first expansions I purchased. And it's just a dope looking ship. It shoots out TIE fighters. It shoots out turbo lasers. It's like, it's that ship that's smaller than the victory class, but bigger than the light cruiser about the same size as the light carrier fit, fit, fits a similar role just more blasters and less fighters in that aspect it's a really cool looking ship i'm gonna want to run a ton of these but ultimately this ship for command villainy is going to hedge a lot of issues that you might have and again this is an imperial so veers gives it plus one plus one it drops something sentinel on it if that sent the sentinel also happens to be imperial veers gives that plus one plus one it's really it's a really cool piece of tech that goes i need to stop something this turn here's a gladiator star destroyer now i have a big five six in space and i have a sentinel somewhere might even be the same thing but if it's not you got two things you got to deal with two two thumbs up all around. Next, we have an upgrade that a lot of people have been waiting to see. Luke's lightsaber. Two cost vigilance heroism upgrade. It gives you plus three plus one. It's an item weapon lightsaber attached to a non-vehicle unit. When played, if attached unit is Luke Skywalker, heal all damage from him and give a shield token to him. So this is actually very different from Vader's saber, which just does a ton of extra damage if it's attached to Vader. I think technically Luke's is better overall because it gives the same stat bonus, but it also can kind of reset the danger that Luke presents to the game. If Luke takes a bunch of hits but isn't dead and you're able to get this onto him, either the same round that he's taking the damage or the round after if you have the initiative, he's clearing all that damage off of him and he's dropping a shield token, which means he's dropping more shield tokens on other things. And then at that point, Luke can swing into Vader with no fear, wipe him off the board and continue swiping at other things as he continues dropping shields on his allies. Next, we have an event that utilizes one of the coolest art pieces from the very beginning of when we started seeing previews for Star Wars Unlimited. And that is overwhelming barrage with this lovely blast of a Star Destroyer just destroying everything. Five cost command villainy tactic. Give a friendly unit plus two plus two for this phase. Then it deals damage equal to its power divided as you choose among any number of other units. It is an uncommon. It's number 92 out of 252 for SOR. Overwhelming Barrage is another example of villainy just punching you in the face and there's nothing you can do about it. Just punch, punch, punch. For five cost, you can give one of your units plus two plus two. And then it just shoots any number of other units. And again, it doesn't say units in the same arena. It doesn't say ground units. It doesn't say space units. You give a friendly unit plus two plus two, and then it just blasts everything. Notably, this is not an attack. So you don't proc any one attack abilities, but that also means that your opponents do not deal damage back to you. So if you stick this on relentless, now you're dropping 10 power across the entire board. You do the same thing with Vader, who ends up being, I think, I think Vader's a six, seven. If I remember correctly, I should know this. That puts them at an eight, nine for the phase, by the way. So they still continue to have this buff even after this effect. And you just blast everything off the board. That pesky Sentinel, get out of here. That thing with a shield on it, we're gonna deal one damage to it and eliminate it later. That thing over there that's bugging me in space, get out of here. Fantastic card. This is one of the one of the best events that we've seen. Definitely the, so far the best command event. I know we haven't seen too many command events, but I would say this is even better than something like Waylay because even though it doesn't bypass all of the things that prevent things from taking damage or prevent things from being destroyed, you can still do enough damage across the board. It's still a very effective card, especially for command villain. Next, we have a cunning card that also comes from the starter deck and was previewed for us through the FFG livestream. It is the rogue operative operating on Scare. Three cost cunning heroism ground unit, two power, four health, rebel trooper, saboteur and raid two. It is a common 194 from SOR. Lowish attack, medium-ish health at a three cost. But the big thing is, is that this will ignore Sentinel. It destroys the defender's shields 
And while it attacks, it's actually a fourth. What that means is, is that you want to be using this. You want to be using your upgrades on this that give it more power to be able to blow up enemy stuff. It doesn't strike first, but it does delete shields and it will do a big chunk of damage when it's attacking in general. So if you can get a big buff to this, say with a the fleet lieutenant or a stacked with a Dodana, you can attack with this out and it's getting a, several stacking plus power buffs to be able to hit something hard it might die in the process or if it's hitting the base it drops a a reasonable chunk of damage onto your opponent's base and if it's got a shield on it which you can do with luke you can do with a couple of other things you threaten something that can't be defeated on one shot minus waylay by just attacking defending it's not as good but attacking it's one of the best things you can get out and just just a fantastic card all around i like the art it reminds me a lot of the rebel pathfinder because they're based off the same group of people uh setting up that detonator bomb so fantastic card you're gonna see a lot of these uh, especially in uh, heroism cunning decks uh this like, like i said this comes out of the starter set so you're gonna be seeing a lot of these initially and i wouldn't be surprised if this carries on in future sets especially in rebel decks because it is as strong as it is and can be easily buffed next we have one of the strongest events in the entire game so far and i think it's probably going to stay that way. This is easily top three designs so far. Something would have to be truly bonkers to be better than this card. We have shoot first one cost cunning event. That is also a trick attack with a unit. It gets plus one plus zero for this combat and deals its combat damage before the defender. If the defender is defeated, it deals no co combat damage. It's an uncommon, it's number 217 of the 252 in SOR. This is Han Solo on an event, or technically Han Solo is shoot first on a stick. If you understand that, congratulations. If you don't, I'm sorry. One, one, one resource allows you to delete anything that has less health than you have attack on the board and you don't take damage back. This is the one of those types of it gets around a couple of different instances of th that big fat sentinel on the board that's going to be dealing damage back to you. Thick cell block guard or one of those um, vigilant honor guards. If you have enough attack plus the shoot first to be able to delete it, it's not dealing damage back to you. So it's not necessarily doing its job. Sure, it costs you a resource to do that. But this thing just shot down one of your biggest defenders or potentially shot down one of your bigger attackers before it could deal the damage out to flip the game in your opponent's favor. This is a fantastic card. And between this waylay and overwhelming barrage, we have a lot of events that are able to, I mean, vanquish even, a lot of events that are designed to handle your opponent's board. Maximum firepower, same thing. Handle the things that are on your opponent's board. For me, shoot first is one step above. And the reason why is because it is cunning. This is gonna slot as a three of, along with waylay, in every single Boba Fett deck. And as we saw in the last video, I'm hyped for Boba Fett. Shoot first is gonna allow you to trigger that extra resource coming back to you. So effectively, shoot first is a delete an opponent's unit without taking damage for free because you're going to get your resource back with your Boba Fett leader. And if your Boba Fett is on the board, you actually come out ahead on the exchange because Boba Fett, when it attacks, brings back two resources if something's been deleted. So if you shoot first with your Boba Fett leader, all of a sudden now you're, you're resource positive off of the shoot first. And this is a fantastic card that I think is going to be a three of in every single cunning deck and every single deck that evol revolves around units on the board attacking and also decks that have cunning in them. A lot of people are going to think that I'm overreacting to this. I'm telling you right now, this is the bet that I am hedging. Shoot first is going to be one of the top events to utilize in the first set and probably in more sets going forward, basically because it is a risk free deletion if you have the power on the board. And that's worth it for one resource. Our next preview is one of two that comes from the same creator, rolling dice and taking names. And it, it's a big chunk, big boy, but not in the way that you might think by the way that I just said that. It is the Blizzard Assault AT-AT, AT, an eight cost command villainy ground unit, nine power, nine health, Imperial Walker vehicle. When this unit attacks and defeats a unit, you may deal the excess damage from this attack to an enemy ground unit. It's an uncommon 88. This is a big chunk. Now, remember before we've talked about vigilance being the big butt command looks like it's going to be the big vehicle thing we've seen 
We've seen the Relentless. We're seeing the Blizzard Assault ATAT. Uh, there's probably going to be other command. There is one other command card that we saw earlier, the Gladiator Star Destroyer. That one, not a bigger, but it does big things. And it is a medium, I guess, vehicle. I think it's big. Uh, the, the Gladiator's cool. Anyway, not the point. The point is that this guy, M. Chonk, and it's called a Blizzard Assault ATAT, which is really cool because it saves design room for a regular ATAT, and it also saves room for Tempest Force. ATAT, -AT, which are the ones that were on Endor. When this unit attacks and defeats a unit, you may deal the excess damage from this attack to an enemy ground unit. So if you spike a unit, say a Sentinel, and you have damage left over, you can clear out another ground unit. It represents the fact that these things were strong, they were blasting units, and there was a lot of damage that they can do. This does not reflect damage onto a base. This does not reflect damage onto multiple units because the second batch of damage is not considered an attack, it's considered an effect. But you can easily two for one with this guy. With nine power, this is gonna kill quite a few things on the board and still be in a good position to be able to blat back on any other unit as it comes down and a great target for maximum firepower. Nine damage coming out of that skadoosh, just blow up pretty much any target on the board with maximum firepower. Next, we have our other preview from Rolling Dice and Taking Names. And this utilizes art that we've seen earlier that I speculated was not character art and I was correct. This is resupply. It is a supply event. Three cost command. Put this event into play as a resource. It is a common. It is number 126 out of 252 from SOR. I'm going to go over this with you guys the way that I had to learn it myself with you all. Excuse me. When a resource is put into play, same thing as a unit. It is put into play exhausted. So at the end of the turn, when you put your resource down, it does not come into play ready. It comes into play exhausted. The reason why you have that, avail that, that resource available for the next turn is the last thing you do at the end of any given round is you ready all of your stuff. And we'll go over why, why that makes sense in the stream section, but it's an indicator to tell your opponent, hey, I'm ready to go, let's go. So resupply, you pay the three, you put it into play as a resource, but it comes into play exhausted. So you won't be able to use it that turn, unlike DJ Laser, who specifically says ready it. But this is your rampant growth without having to pull a card out of your deck that will allow you to just pay the cost, put it into play, exhausted, and then that's like your thing. So you, if you have the initiative and you know there's not gonna be a lot, you could pass your opponent does their thing you resupply their opponent does the second thing you take the initiative and then your opponent does the remainder of what they need to do in a turn right something simple like that on round two because remember you'll have that third resource by them this puts you in a position to be able to ramp up to having those big command plays resupply thankfully is just command it is not command villainy or command heroism so both sides can use it unlike dj laser who's command villainy this gives both sides the opportunity to continue that ramping special that D the super laser technician is able to do that's why i keep calling it dj laser because that's what i like to call it some other people do as well that ramp puts you in a position to be able to get your higher cost things out quicker somebody could splash in the command as their base if they're not if their leader isn't command in order to be able to utilize this as like a small command package to get their other things for another uh, for another style aspect into play faster but you're pretty much almost only going to see these in just command decks that are also running the big chunky command boys gladiator star destroyer blizzard force at at we just saw relentless down the line and any other things. Uh, e even the Vader deck can utilize this to get one Vader out quicker, but two Emperor Palpatine out quicker. So you can do that extra force lightning shock and blow up a bunch of units on the board way before your opponent is ready to deal with it. Ramp is gonna be serious in this, but it'll be interesting to see which color can take advantage of Command's ramp the most. Fantastic card though, fantastic art. Love my hair, I love my Sabine. Just super happy to see this all around. Our last preview comes by way of the FFG Twitter and Instagram accounts. Link to the Twitter account down below. It is our third Vigilance preview in the Vigilance cycle. The last thing I believe we have is a Vigilance unit because we got a base, we got an upgrade, we got the event today, and then next week, theoretically, we should get the 
the units. So it's a pretty interesting card. We have It Binds All Things. This is a force event. It is a two cost vigilance event. Heal up to three damage from a unit. If you control a force unit, you may deal that much damage to another unit. It's a rare number 75 from SOR. This isn't exactly a, a parallel or a, a similar design to Force Choke, but it does proc off the same thing that Force Choke does, which is it, you get a kicker for force unit force choke just reduces the cost this allows you to heal the damage from something to deal the damage to another if you have a force unit so for vigilance we know luke obi-wan and yoda but if you were to put this into a aggression deck say vader you would have vader and emperor palpatine and obviously because force is a tag going forward we will definitely have more opportunities to utilize this i would say right now this is probably a card that just sees play in a blue Luke force focused deck but starting with set three Twilight of the Republic which is likely going to have a lot of Clone Wars and prequel trilogy representation you'll see a lot more use for this card then so pick up your copies of these now this is actually a really good card it doesn't it it costs more than repair does but it does more it does twice as much as repair does and it is you're just healing from a unit dealing damage to a unit if you have the force units on the board so you can't heal base deal damage to base that arguably can be better to keep the tempo in your favor which is going to be very important in this game because sequencing your events to make sure your opponent can't do things while you can do things is always going to be the most important aspect of playing star wars unlimited so it binds all things pretty good card we got luke trying to get his lightsaber anyway before we get into coverage about the actual stream, the last thing after these previews that I want to showcase to you is something that was showed during the stream. The developers, Josh, Danny, and Jeremy were very gracious and very kind to showcase to us the entire deck list for both the Luke Skywalker deck and the Darth Vader deck in the starter, a product that's not coming out for at least another four months to have com almost complete knowledge of everything that's in these things. But like I said, there's three cards that were missing, but it is important to at least know what each of these decks contains and a very important piece of information, which we all show you right now, the numbers of the cards that are actually gonna be in the set. So we can see here all of the cards that are available for the Luke Skywalker deck. You get one Luke Skywalker leader, you get one administrator's tower base, you get one 2-1-B surgical droid, three R2-D2s, three Alliance X-Wings, three C-3PO's, one Rebel Pathfinder, two restored ARC 170s, three Leia Organas, one Rogue Operative, three Fleet Lieutenants, one Wing Leader, one Yoda, one Cloud City Wing Guard, one System Control uh, Patrol Craft, three Consular Security Force, one Liberator Gunship, one General Dodonna, one Snow Speeder, one Chewbacca, one Vigilant Honor Guards, one Obi-Wan Kenobi, one Han Solo, one Resilient, three Luke Lightsabers, two Repair, one Shoot First, two Asteroid Sanctuary, two Surprise Strike, two Waylay, and three Vanquish. Two things to point out here. One, Resilient, that is a card we don't know what it does yet. There's a theory that the three cards from these two separate decks that we don't know about are from uh, creator previews. So I'm hoping that the creators that have those previews or are getting those previews can showcase to us those to us soon so people can get that testing for the starter decks. But the big major thing here is you can see R2-D2, C-3PO, and Luke's lightsaber, which are all starter exclusive cards, all have three copies in these decks, which means if you want, to, oh, and the Leia Organa, one of the most important cards in this entire deck. If you want to be able to have a play set of every card in the game, you only need to buy one starter. Me, I'm buying three. The reason why is, is I wanna be able to have one starter in the box with the two decks so that if I need to teach somebody, I can just say, here you go, here's the whole deck, let's play, blah, 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 get it all done. It's like a box game, right? But then two more so that I can have double the amount of starter copies in case I need to build multiple decks because I'm neurotic like that. But it's a pretty good spread. You also do get included one of each of the rares that are really good, the Obi-Wan and the Han Solo. You get a nice coverage of commons and uncommons and good a good amount of copies of certain things like the Alliance X-Wing, the Fleet Lieutenant, the uh, two copies of the, uh, the Surprise Strike, the Waylay, three copies of the Vanquish, 
all, all of those are great cards to be able to have. Well, it'll be interesting to see what resilient is. There's a lot of people who have speculation based upon the card listings, where they land and what they're going to cost and what they're going to be. I'm not here to deal with any of that. Resilient is a card that's in this deck. We don't know what it does. We might sue. We have the Darth Vader deck list. So again, one Darth Vader leader, one command center base, two TIE line fighters, three Death Star Stormtroopers, one Admiral Ozzel, two First Legion Snowtroopers, three Admiral Mahdi, two Stormtrooper Lieutenants, two Viper Probe Droids, one Admiral Piet, three Super Laser Technicians, three Cell Block Guards, one General Veers, three Grand Moff Tarkins, three Imperial Interceptors, one TIE Advance, two ATSTs, one Gladiator Star Destroyer, one Blizzard Assault at, -AT one Emperor Palpatine, one Relentless, three Vader Sabres, one Recruit, one Force Choke, one Resupply, three Open Fire, three I Am Your Father, one Maximum Firepower, and one Overwhelming Barrage. Three copies of the Mahdi of the Tarkin and the Vader Saber along with I Am Your Father so that you can have all of that without having to buy more than one deck. The two cards in here that we don't know are Admiral Piet and Recruit. Admiral Piet, obviously a character. Recruit, we don't know. Darth Vader deck. I'm not gonna lie. I think this deck is much better than the Luke deck. I think on average, two similar skill players, the Vader deck is probably gonna win more often than not. The aggression that comes out of it and the ability to control the board with things like the cell block guards, with open fires, with maximum firepower, to be able to move forward with your resources with the super laser technicians and resupply to get things like Vader, Relentless, and Emperor Palpatine on the board faster, and then more control through the, Glad uh, the Gladiator Star Destroyer, and even the TIE Advance with those extra experience tokens. This is, is a really cool deck for aggression, villainy, command to be able to start out with. And obviously there's some cuts you'd make, there's some ads you'd make, some changes for the cards that we know, but as it stands, this is a reasonable deck. And according to the devs, which we'll get into in the live stream here in just a moment, the decks are very balanced against each other, and it's not one deck is stronger than the other. Players of average skill should actually be able to win about 50% of the time. I just think the way that Vader is, is listed, unless the other person really knows how to play the game, Vader probably has the ability to be more aggressive and make a couple more mistakes, whereas Luke has to make efficient trades every time. But these deck lists are fantastic, and they are going to provide us with everything we need to be able to start the game. I think these are great starter decks for people to get in get in the game with and then you can just build from there i know the second copy of this vader deck it's getting torn apart and it's going to be retooled into a bubba fett deck i just haven't decided on what the secondary aspect is going to be this past wednesday we had ffg live on august 23rd and the big thing that we got was the almost entire starter deck reveal and a playthrough of the starter decks themselves. So we had uh, Josh Massey, our organized play program manager. We had Danny Schaefer, our lead game designer. We had Jeremy Zrin, uh, another game designer, another lead game designer. I'm not, I, I should remember all these titles. I normally write them down and I didn't because we also had uh, a hidden Jeremy around for commentating, which was fun. The four of them getting together and doing this was actually a really cool way of showcasing the strengths of the game, the strengths of a community of the game and all kinds of cool stuff. One of the things they did change about the set is that they did put new displays of the game genetic products in the back. So we had the dual big stronghold style uh, deck box. We had the smaller ones of those, the basic ones in the back. I don't know if there were any of the mat. I think some of the mats were like rolled up next to them, but nothing of the display of the mat except for their play space was the two player zones and it printed on the mat, mat, the XL mat, which was really cool. Very easy for them to be able to showcase the game. We did have Danny playing Luke and we had Jeremy playing Vader. The contents of the starter decks are Vigilance, Cunning, Heroism, Luke, and Aggression, Villainy, Command, Vader. But they did give us a quick rundown before they started the game of the starter decks include 250 card decks, uh, the exclusive starter cards that come within the deck, as we went over earlier, will have a full play set of starter starter cards. So you don't have to buy more than one if you don't want to. It comes with a printed pamphlet of the quick start rules. It comes with two paper play mats, as a lot of these starter deck style games do come with. And those have the basic references on the mat, what you can do per turn, what an action is, how the round breakdowns are and then obviously the printed zones and the mats themselves it does come with two cardboard deck boxes so that you can uh, 
uh, unfold the deck, the deck box into a deck box, put your deck into it, and then slide it away, which is a really cool thing. It'll come with shield and experience tokens, which are double-sided in the starter, but they are not double-sided in the boosters. And we'll come back to that later because that's an important point. And it does also come with the counters for damage. So that is the contents of the starter deck. Really good. We don't have a price point for it yet. I'll go ahead and say right now, my guesstimate for price point is going to be $40. And I know a lot of people are like, oh my God, that's crazy expensive. Except if you think about it, it's $20 per deck and that's not that bad. Especially considering the fact that the decks are playable and they do come with copies of cards that are going to be very good. Yes, that does mean that for starter decks personally, as I said earlier, I'm probably gonna end up buying three of them. I'm gonna have to spend $120, but I'm already in for a penny in for a pound. So like, we're just, we're, we're whole hogging this, right? The backside of the starter base. So the administration, administrator tower for cunning and the command center for command have the deck lists on the back of them for what each deck includes. So you can just flip the card over, make sure you have everything together, flip it back and go. So that's really cool. The other thing is, is that they did tell us that in the boosters themselves, the bases are double sided, but on the back of the base is going to be the token that we know of. So right now it's shield and, uh, and experience, which is really cool. That means that when they eventually go through the layout of the boosters, the base of the token will take the same slot. Now I had a theory that has changed obviously because of this information, but we'll, we'll put it on paper here, put it on recording. So that way y'all know what I'm thinking of for a booster pack. Originally, I believe it was 15 cards. Yeah, 15 cards per booster. Now it can really realistically be 14, but I was thinking six commons, four uncommons, one rare, one foil slot. That's 12 playable cards in the set. One leader, one base, and one token. And that comes to 15 cards total. Now they recognize that because of the way limited works is that you're gonna have to be drafting and doing sealed out of the packs. You're gonna need access to base bases and leaders, we do know for sure that there's going to be a base in every pack, which means there's probably also going to be a leader in every pack, and I'm certain that's going to be the case. That drops the, the listing of the pack breakdown, if my theory is correct, down to 14 cards, which should be more manageable. The idea of having the leader and the base in every single pack means that when you're drafting, you have the selection of the, of the leaders and the bases that you need, and then at the same time, you also have the selection of tokens because they are on the back of the base. So any extra bases you get, you can just plop down as tokens wherever and wherever and whenever you need them, which is a fantastic way of saving cardboard. Anyway, I still think we're gonna be dealing with a booster pack having six commons, four uncommons, one rare, one foil. They could change it that it's six commons, three uncommons, two rares, and a foil. It is something that I still think 6411 liter base is going to be what we see for packs. And that's my prediction, and I'm right. <laughs> they did state once again that the accessories, the game genic accessories, all of that other stuff will be launched same day as Star Wars Unlimited. I will not, I'm not gonna go into hyper details about the match specifically. Just go watch it. It's a fantastic match. The stream was an hour and a half long, but it's still well worth watching because they didn't, they didn't play one game. They played two games and that's fantastic. So we're just gonna go over a couple of things here to try to get this quicker. Our first piece of information here is Tyler goes off on a tangent about readying resources at the end of the round. And they had asked, have we ever explained why that's the case? The answer was no, obviously. The reason they had tried to balance resources Resource, readying resources and, and items at the beginning of the turn, at the end of the turn, and a couple of different things. But ultimately, they came down to doing it at the end of the round because it is a declaration of I am ready for the next round. So you, you put your resource into play exhausted, and then you ready up all your stuff, and that is your tell to your opponent, hey, I'm ready to go to the next round whenever you are, or vice versa, or if both players do it at the same time, cool, we're ready, let's go. Whoever's got the initiative starts slamming cards down or making actions, so on and so forth, right? I think it's a fantastic idea because there are a lot of people, much to my chagrin, that don't talk when they play card games. Technically, this reinforces the, I don't say a single word in the entire game type thing, but at least it's a level of communication to your opponent that I'm ready to go for the next round. Let's 
let's go. There was a clarification of a rules interaction that occurred in the Roll On Gaming video with Aaron Holston about Overwhelm attacking into a shield. And they did clarify the rule that there was a mistake made in the original video, which that's, there's nothing on Aaron for that or Kevin for the video itself. There's no issues around. When a unit with Overwhelm attacks into a shield, Overwhelm, as a reminder, any damage let carried over from defeating a unit goes into the base. All damage is blocked when you hit the shield. It's not you deal the damage to the health and then the, the, it goes over to the base and the unit still survives. The shield specifically on the card does say blocks all damage. So all damage, nothing carries over to the base. The unit survives all that other stuff. One of the things that Tyler had interjected was many of the cards are worded to be optional in terms of triggers and so on and so forth. That way, in case anyone misses a trigger, it's just, okay, you had your opportunity, you didn't do it, just move on to reduce game state issues. That way, there's no mandatory effects that require things to be walked back. One of the things that Josh stated, and I believe I said it earlier, but if not, the starters feel quite balanced against each other. So as a box product, they are probably going to be likely very popular with Star Wars fans because you can just pick up the starter decks, sleeve them all together, shuffle up and play, and you've got uh, uh, the iconic Luke versus Vader, and they're even in the same location on the cards. Like, that's just art, pure art. Josh, the amazing person that he is, Josh Massey, OP, both overpowered and organized play, decided that it was time to bring up the interaction with epic actions. And I'm gonna read you, I'm not gonna show it on screen, but I'm gonna read you the way that Boba Fett's leader epic action reads. And this is the way that all leader epic actions read. Epic action, if you control five or more resources, deploy this leader. There is a window here, much similar to what, jo what Tyler said earlier, that this potentially can be considered a may effect because the wording of the of the epic action says if you control so you potentially could activate this and say i activate my epic action pass i do not control the resources to do this because if you do control the resources you have to deploy it that's a mandatory effect but if you don't then you just epic action and pass now one of the things that was gone over in the star wars unlimited discord was a question was asked if my opponent activates their epic action and deploys their leader but i realize within that moment that they don't have the resources because it's not a mandatory effect of having the resources to activate the epic action would you allow your opponent to take the play back i said yes some people said no and it got into a big argument a couple other people also said yes it got into a big argument on the server about this ruling so going back to what josh said can someone waste their epic action if they try to use it but they don't have the resources jeremy specifically said technically you could but it is a misplay and that shouldn't be punished jeremy also specifically called out intent if you are intending to call out the epic, epic action and fail, it's fine. So you can do this for the intent of gaining tempo advantage, but you do lose your leader at that point. But if you miscount resources, it's something that should be pulled back. And what this says to me is, is that Jeremy, as a player and as a designer, recognizes that people are playing a game and they're trying to have fun. So sitting there and being a rules lawyer and saying, oh, well, you activated the epic action and you didn't have the resources, so you don't get to deploy your leader ever because you activated the epic action. That is is really dumb. And I know that I probably shouldn't be making fun of people when it comes to this on my channel, which is generally supposed to be a positive interaction for Star Wars Unlimited stuff, but there, there has to be a line drawn. This far, no further. The base concept of going out and playing a game means that you should be able to go and have fun. I understand in highly competitive environments, people are go gunning for prizes, and there are prize sharks out there, there are rules, rules lawyers and rules sharks out there, and all this other type of stuff. You just have to learn how to deal with the way that these types of people interact but you yourself as a person can also say you know what i don't need this advantage to win the game i either am a better player or i can at least help this other person become a better player because realistically if you go to a tournament and you're there and you play five rounds i, I heard this said about somebody who plays age of sigmar and it's a fantastic concept i'm not there to win five games i'm there to make five friends and you can still do that in competitive environments i watched the flesh and blood tournament over the weekend and every one of those people seemed super nice super cool Obviously, in the moment, they're probably stressed playing the actual game, but there never seemed to be a situation where anybody was mad about what the opponent was doing or just upset about the gameplay or their own gameplay or anything like that. 
And I think we need to share that energy. We need to bring that non-toxicity to the table and say, you know what? Technically, you would have activated this and this isn't, you wouldn't be able to deploy the leader, but I'm not going to hold that against you. You can use the epic action at the appropriate time when you have the resources for this. And that engenders an environment of we're all here to play a game some of us want to win and be competitive, but we don't have to sacrifice being nice to do so. There are too many people out there that do that, and that is unacceptable. And as it stands right now, hear me, I'm going to say any community I'm a part of will not be not be allowing people to be like that. You do it once. Congratulations. You did it once. You're no longer welcome. Number one rule, don't be a dick. Prior to this epic action conversation, which again, thank you very much, Josh, Danny ended up winning the game. His Luke 1-0, and the chat demanded a rematch. Danny and Jeremy acquiesced, and it was cool, and they did all of their stuff. Stream was ridiculously long. There was an article that went up about a lot of the stuff that was previewed. That will also be in the description below. A couple of housekeeping points here. In the second game, space was very empty, and I think that's just because there's not a lot of space units in the actual deck, as they have said that ground is the big focus for the game, but I think that all decks should at least have some sort of space component, so that way you can get those space cards out, and not leave that arena empty but at the same time also put pressure on your opponent if they choose to leave that arena empty uh the second game was much longer than the first it was much closer they they had a lot of back and forth in that somebody had asked in the chat what's the highest number of resources that you hit in playtesting both danny and tyler specifically said that they had hit 16 which may hint that there could be very high resource costs 10 12 14 16 i think it's more that they just wanted to be able to play more than one card a turn one big card a turn because i think right now relentless is a nine and that's the highest highest cost we have right now but if something could go up to like i said 10 12 14 you've got 16 resources at some point danny ends up winning the the, the final play of the game with a top decked fleet lieutenant goes 2-0 to pick up the match and luke skywalker has saved the galaxy by not succumbing to the dark side and defeating lord vader in cloud city slash the death star because bases and that was a fantastic game that they played lots of cool stuff like i said please go watch this stream I did the recap as best I could. I tried to shorten it down as much as possible. I didn't shorten it as much as I should have. Ultimately, it's still well worth the watch. If you only watch one piece of content outside of my videos, of course, please go watch this FFG Live posted in the description below. So that way you can see an example of gameplay from two high level game players. And that's all she wrote. Fantastic week of previews and starter deck stuff and gameplay and all kinds of cool things. Really excited for the continuation of the game. I would love for this starter deck to release early, but it's not going to. Everything comes out in 2024. The starter deck, the boosters, the accessories, everything. Save your money now. It's going to be fun. Last week was a quiet week. Next week, probably be a quiet week, but We'll still be here talking about stuff. If it's too quiet, I might do an extra video talking about something called Felt Table. Stay tuned. Ultimately, there was a lot of cool stuff here. A lot of extra things coming out for build better decks. Luke is a better deck right now. Vader is a better deck right now. Leia is a better deck right now. Boba Fett is a better deck right now, including the cards that we've seen. Lots of people are out there playtesting their stuff, utilizing Tabletop Simulator or printed proxies at their local shop. And people are getting into this and getting ready to go. And I'm, I'm just as excited as they are, but I'm, I'm pulling back my game play a little bit because playing off the small subset of previews that we've gotten is not indicative of the way that the entire game is going to play when set one comes out. As we get closer to the release of the set, I might print out some proxy decks just to try things out so I know what I'm searching for when it comes to actually getting booster boxes and when it comes to getting singles afterwards. It'll be very interesting to see how the singles market shakes out. Lorcana immediately had TCG player presence. I'm hoping Star Wars Unlimited does as well, so that way anybody who needs to get pick up their singles can do so like i said before i'm probably in for a case i might try more it just depends on what's going to be available to me at local shops in the area and how big a case is if a case is four four booster boxes I'm, i'll be good with that if a case is 12 booster boxes might have to figure something else out but that's it that's like i said that's all she wrote that's everything we've got this week i hope you all enjoyed this fantastic stream that came out comment below what you think about the stream what you think about the leaders that we have and how these new cards showcase to them comment Comment down below specifically what you think the most powerful event we've seen is so far. Obviously, waylay and shoot first for me, but you might have a difference of opinion, and I want to hear that. That way, we can all communicate together in this wonderful world of the internet. For wonderful's a, a reach, but the wonderful world of my YouTube channel. Like, comment, subscribe to the video. 
hit the bell, do all the different YouTube uh, things. Follow me on all the different socials, Twitter, Mastodon, Blue Sky, Twitch. You're already here on YouTube. I do have an Instagram I very, very rarely ever use. It's all in the links where it needs to be. Thank you very much for joining me, folks. I'll see you all next week, and I'll see you in the stars.